of what can folks do this year right now to significantly reduce the need for fertilizer while growing really healthy plants are going to attract deer and benefit deer also. As we're using three different products and each one of those has multiple organisms in it. So, you know, there's, there's tens of millions of different species. In real terms, these organisms can take nutrients out of those rocks, and not all at once, not like grinders out there pounding rocks down. Right, right and make them available to plant. And I believe after watching this for 20 plus years, you know, we've been no-tilling and planting blends for a long time, even before I understood all this stuff. And I'm now understanding that it's these microbes and bacteria and fungus that are that are utilizing that base, just like it would in the clay or something that's hard to deal with to provide yeah. these nutrients to the plants. Yeah, the worse your soil is, the absolutely more important it is for you to have the right biology. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining Growing Deer again. Today, I'm really excited because of my friend Keith Burns in Nebraska. Keith, what's the weather like up there today? Well, Grant, we actually have some nice weather. We've been really cold, but uh, we're looking at mid-40s today, and so we're going to melt some of the snow off and just kind of lifts everybody's spirits a little bit when the sun comes out. So. Yeah, we haven't been as cold as you have, but it's the same here. Sun's out, and I was out walking yesterday doing a little scouting, and planning on where I'm going to do some prescribed fire. And it was good to see that snow melting here too. It's been wet and we're a week or more away from burning and a long ways away from planting. A lot of people are getting excited about food plot season as happens every year. But unless you're in South Florida, February is way too early to be putting seed in yeah. the ground. Yep. It's, it's time to plan, not time to plant. That's right. Now, frost seeding, snow seeding, some guys are spreading some clover out there. We've done that ourselves. And if you're curious, you can see a video where Daniel recently, we had a couple inches of snow and it was a chance to let that snow kind of take it in. And that works with clover, as you know, Keith, because it's a real small, hard seed. Until it gets warm enough, it won't imbibe or take enough moisture in to germinate. But if you did something like, let's just say a wheat or a soybean, a soft seed, and you spread it in the snow, yeah. You're just baiting no. turkeys is all you're doing, right? You're not you're not going to get anything growing out of that. Right. Yep. So the clover clover is great uh, for doing that. Uh, you know, we have a lot of guys that are growing wheat that are frost seeding clover into their wheat as well. But, but they planted the wheat last year and they're frost seeding clover over the top. So, yeah, same principle. Same principle, getting that companion crop growing, get some free nitrogen, which is one of the things we're going to talk about today. They're, those guys are putting clover in that wheat. One of the reasons is to add some nitrogen. Isn't that correct, Keith? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, we, you know, as a as an ag industry and even the food plot industry, we spend billions of dollars putting nitrogen into our soil. And there's 30,000 tons of nitrogen above, above every acre of crop ground, every food plot acre, there's 30,000 tons of nitrogen. But God never designed the plants to get that nitrogen directly out of the atmosphere. It has to go through the bugs. It has to go through the biology. And that's why I'm pretty excited to have this conversation today about some things that we can do to help your plants and help your food plots access all that free nitrogen. Yeah, that's exactly right. So years ago, I was watching Keith and Green Cover from a distance. He didn't know who I was or deer were just something that ran in front of the combine every now and then. And and man, I just love their intensity of research and their commitment to doing what's right. And we finally met and talked, and there was just a really good relationship there based on principles besides deer or antlers, just stuff we have in common. So Keith has really come on board and learned a lot about food plot and food plot farmers, guys like me. And cost is a big issue these days. And Keith and I have had a lot of concerns about this. Now, Keith goes to numerous conferences. I know you were in Maine the other day. and you're, I mean, you're all over in ag conferences. Is that correct, Keith? And yeah, I've been on the road a lot. Tomorrow I'm headed to Idaho and to Washington to, to speak to different groups of farmers. And so we have the, the luxury of working with, you know, tens of thousands of farmers across almost a million acres. So we get lots of feedback from, from these guys. And, and, you know, what we're doing with the regenerative food plots, it's utilizing the same plants and it's the same principles. We're just putting them in different combinations that work better for deer, you know, with your expertise and, and trying to hit the timing right. So we're able to take a lot of the knowledge that we accumulate from working with these large scale farmers and then bring it back to the food plotters, to the homesteaders who are doing, you know, smaller plots, smaller acreages, but, but really still trying to accomplish the same goals. 
And that's building your soil while at the same time trying to grow your livestock, whether it be cattle, sheep, or in this instance, deer. It's, it's really the same principles. Same principles. Soil's the same, it, you know, and these, these principles work anywhere there's soil and air and water, which is pretty much most places on the dry part of the planet anyway. So, you know, I, I follow along a lot of ag stuff. I actually work, as you know, with some ag guys that just happen to have some deer too. And one of the big talks is the cost of fertilizer. They're up many, many fold in the last couple of years. And, and there's, we're not seeing a rise in like lumber prices have been coming down a little bit, but that's not true of fertilizer, is it, Keith? No, it's not. And, and you know, there's there's huge demand for these fertilizers yet because commodity prices of corn, soybeans, wheat, cotton, all these things are at record levels. So even with the high fertilizer prices, we don't see farmers cutting back as much as we thought we would. And that's keeping a lot of pressure uh, on the demand side of that market. So, I, yeah, I don't know that we're going to see a decrease in fertilizer prices uh, anytime soon. So a lot of farmers have come to you, and you're a farmer, a pretty big farmer, so you're working on this, and I'm working on this, and I've got little high food plots and stuff. It's just tough to get fertilizer, too. Fertilizer's heavy, it's bulky, and you've got your little secret hunting spot back in the timber, you know, across the creek and up the hill. And so... I'm just so blessed, and you've been telling me about this through time. I'm really excited, but you have, using just, again, nature, God's principles, come up with a way where we can significantly reduce the amount of fertilizer necessary, or be like me, I've weaned off fertilizer. I'm not using any fertilizer unless, you know, I take a brand new place out timber and make a hidey old food plot where I've just pounded it, getting it ready to do it, and I may start with a little fertilizer, but I want today for you to share, I want to focus on that, and hopefully I don't get us going down a rabbit hole of what can folks do this year, right now, to significantly reduce the need for fertilizer while growing really healthy plants are going to attract deer and benefit deer also. Yeah, and you know, if we're going to reduce fertilizer, which which we should and we can, because you're right, it's it's a significant expense. And it's also, you know, the, the commercial fertility that we're putting out there, whether you're a farmer or a food plotter, it's, it's not natural. And, and, it, and it does some disturbance and some interruptions to the natural systems that we're trying to build. So if we're going to replace some of that, we can't just shut it off cold turkey. We have to replace it with how nature, how, how God designed the system to work. And that's to reintroduce the biological activity that we need to, to naturally unlock the nutrients that are in the soil, as well as to access all that nitrogen we were talking about that's that's in the atmosphere right above us. So what we decided to do this year, and, and we're, we're doing this across the board on all of our growing deer, green cover, food plot mixes. We, we really struggled with this uh, because it does, is it going to add some cost to the seed? I'm not, not going to lie about that. You know, this, these, these are not free products. But in the end, we decided that it's important enough that we wanted to have it as just a standard part of our mixes because we really feel like that's going to set what we have to offer apart from everybody else in the industry, uh, not only with the diversity of the seed that we're putting in there, which you know we've talked about before, but now also with the diversity of the biology that is going to be put right on the seed. So when you go out and you plant it, you're not only getting really good high quality seed, but you're getting an extraordinarily diverse uh, amount of biological organisms that are going to do a number of different things within the system. Yeah, and you and I, maybe I'll slow down a second. We loosely throw out this word biology, biological systems, whatever. Let's, de let's define that. And, I, and I'm guilty of using you know, the word microbes, but we're really talking about bacteria. And what are those bacteria doing? Because Bacteria, we've always been taught in school and things that, you know, wash our hands, buy some bacteria on there or whatever. So what, what are we talking about here, Keith? Let's break that down for guys like me. Sure. Yeah. You know, the, the two main types of bugs, if you will, that we're going to be putting on the seed and out in your soils going to be bacteria. And we'll talk about some of the specific ones here in a little bit. But the also the other really big important one is is different fungal populations. And again, you think of a fungus and you, you normally think, well, that's a disease. And, and it's true. There are a lot of diseases that are fungal in nature, uh, but the specific fungus that we're going to be using, the mycorrhiza fungal populations, 
are extraordinarily beneficial and scientists are learning new things every day about how important these organisms are to a natural native system for those plants to be able to access the nutrients and even water in the soil. If you have good mycorrhiza fungi colonization of your plants, your, 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 your fields are going to be incredibly drought tolerant. And I know drought was a big deal across not just Nebraska, not just Kansas, across a large area this year, even in areas like yours, Grant, where you guys don't normally have those long periods of, of no rain. Uh, when you have the right biology, it can access more water from the soil as well as the nutrients. So bacteria and, and, and fungus are the two main ones. But there's, you know, it, but it, it almost doesn't do it justice to say, well, there's those two main categories because within those categories, you know, there's there's tens of millions of different species uh, in in natural and native systems. Now, you know, we're trying to introduce the ones that have shown to be the most effective, and these are all naturally occurring organisms. These are not something that a mad scientist made in a lab and. You know, we're trying to put out a, a modified type organism. These are ones that have been found to be very effective in nature. They've been nurtured in a lab to increase the populations, but they start with something that is natural and native to the soils, increase those populations, put them in a form that they're stable, that we can add to the seed, and then we put them back in the soil. And then when they get rehydrated, you know, when the moisture from your soil makes that seed germinate, it also wakes up those those microbes, those bugs, and gets them going to do the things that they're supposed to do. So, Keith, that, that's a great explanation. I think a lot of food plotters like myself, we kind of understand this a little bit because we've been told to inoculate clover or inoculate mm -hmm. alpha, alpha. But we're not just talking about that. That's one form, rhizobia, but we're talking about something much broader, right? I mean, that's that was always for nitrogen and a plant that was kind of paired with that, but we're talking about phosphorus and, yep, yep. you know, the expensive part of fertilizer. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So, so what we're doing is we're using three different products and each one of those has multiple organisms in it. And so you'll see if you order food plot seed from us, from, from green cover, uh, you'll see that there'll be a sticker on the bags. It's going to say it's been inoculated with the green boost package. Now, Green Boost is, is not a product. It's, it's simply what we're calling the three different products as we put them together and we put them all on the seed. So there's, there's three main products that we're using. And, and Grant, to your point, well, let's just talk about the Rhizobia first. The first one is the Rhizobia. So we have a product called Rhizofixer Plus, and it has the Rhizobia, which are the bacteria that will work with your legume plants, whether it's soybeans, cow peas, uh, you know, field peas, winter peas, any of those, every legume needs the right bacteria in order to grab that atmospheric nitrogen. Because that the, the nitrogen in the atmosphere is bonded to each other. They, they won't break apart. And that's that's why plants can't get them. And it's it's good that they're doing that because if you've ever taken a whiff of, of ammonia, anhydrous ammonia, you know how destructive that can be to the human body. So 78% of our nitrogen, 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. If it wasn't inert, we'd all be dead. And then it'd really be no point to have this conversation. But that, that inertness makes it unavailable for plants. But these bacteria can secrete the right enzymes. They, they create the right proteins. And they can actually pull those nitrogen molecules apart. And then they make it available for the plant. So it's a really cool way that God has designed the bugs to work in conjunction with the plants. And... What a lot of people don't realize is that almost every legume has a very specific type of bacteria that it works with it. So there's not just one type of rhizobia. Now, several of the clovers can share the same rhizobia family, but soybeans are completely different than clover. Alfalfa is different than clover. The cowpeas that we're gonna be using are gonna be different. The peas are gonna be different. So this Rhizofixer Plus that we have, it's, it's being custom made for us by a company uh, called Terramax out of Minnesota, it has all the different species in there. So we have the ones for the clovers. We have the ones for the soybeans, the cow peas, the field peas. So it's it's kind of an all-inclusive one. And the other, the other thing about rhizobia is of all of the organisms that we're using, they are by far the what I would term the weakest or the most susceptible to dying off if they're not put into the soil right away. 
And if you look at a lot of typical inoculant packages that are out on the market, the, the, the less expensive ones anyway, and we, we sell these too, um, they will say right on the bag, you must get it into the soil 24 to 48 hours after putting it on the seed. It just doesn't have a long shelf life on the seed. And that's always been an issue. And that's why in the past, we have always had the customers add the rhizobia right before they plant. Well, this, this new formula, this, this company in Minnesota, they have a patented process where they're able to take that rhizobia, they, they somehow are encapsulating it and putting those things to sleep. And, and now we're getting 60 to 90 days uh, of viability. Once we put it on the seed, uh, we have 60 to 90 days. So that's, that's, that's been a huge game changer for us as a company because now we're able to put that product on the seed when we're mixing it. So it gets completely dispersed because you guys all know how hard it is to, you know, take that little bag and dump it in and try to get, and, you know, usually we kind of say, well, that's probably good enough or close enough. And a lot of times it is, but this way it gets thoroughly and completely mixed all through the seed. And uh, there, there's, there's no extra effort on the customer's part. So 60 to 90 days. Uh, so that's great. Now, if you're ordering, like I know we've got people ordering their fall release that they're not going to plant until August, probably, and they're ordering it now to save on shipping, and, and that makes complete sense. Uh, you probably are going to need to order some extra rhizobia inoculant. So you can just kind of freshen that up. And even after 90 days, it's not like all those things just automatically die. You're just going to start seeing the viability of the rhizobia decrease over time. So, so we'll have it available. We'll have additional rhizobia available to order. Keith, man, this is exciting. But if you're like me, I'm a busy guy. I may forget to get that inoculant, you know, come fall planting time. So what's a workaround on that that makes it easy for guys like me? Yeah, so if, if you're ordering your fall release now and it's going to be more than that 90-day window, then, you know, you'll need to order some additional rhizobia inoculant. We'll send it with the seed. It'll be either in a bucket or a bag, and it will be right there with the seed. If you're just getting a little bit, it'll be inside the box. But it'll be a separate package. Make sure you take that inoculant and just store it in your house. It doesn't have to be in a refrigerator but just keep it at room temperature. What, what really hurts this stuff is high temperature. So don't leave it out in your shed, you know, where it's going to get 90 plus degrees. Keep it in your house, keep it in your basement, and then apply that right before you plant. And so uh, it's just important that you take care of that inoculant. And then remember, remember to pull it out of your basement and put it on the seed. But if you're ordering your summer release now and you're planting in, in, in April and May, no problem. It's going to be ready to go right out of the bag. So that Rhizofixer Plus has all those rhizobia for the different legumes in the mix. Now, the plus part is that there are three other organisms in there. There's three other bacteria in there. And one of them is a what we call a free living nitrogen fixer. So rhizobia have to associate with a legume plant. The rhizobia will do nothing uh, for the non-legumes. So the buckwheat, the sunflowers, the, the grain sorghum. Uh, all of those things, any of your brassicas, they'll do nothing to help them. They only will help the legume that they associate with. But what we call the free living nitrogen fixer. So like in, in this case, we have a azospirillum. It's, 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 a, it's a family of bacteria that do the same thing. They take that atmospheric nitrogen, they break it apart, they make it available to a plant. But these guys can, can give that, they can trade that, if you will, to a sorghum plant to a sunflower plant, to a buckwheat plant. They work with anybody that's willing to feed them because these guys have to get fed and, and the plants are producing that carbon through photosynthesis and that's how they're feeding it. And I've got a really good explanation of this. If you've never watched the Carbonomics talk that I do, uh, it has a really good explanation of, of how all this works together. So we've got the azospirillum in there, which can be producing and providing nitrogen for all the non-legume plants. And then there's two organisms, two bacteria in there that help release phosphorus. So nitrogen comes from the atmosphere. There, there's no phosphorus in the atmosphere, but phosphorus is part of our soil. It's, it's a mineral that our soils are made up of. But if you send in a soil test, the test is only going to show you the phosphorus that's available for a plant to get, not the phosphorus that's in your soil. And usually that first number is pretty small. Oftentimes, You'll send in a test and you can send your test into ward labs and get your soil tested. 
And it's, you know, it might show only 10 parts per million or something of phosphorus. And it's going to say you should add some, but it's not going to show you how much phosphorus is totally in your soil, the inorganic portion. Well, again, plant roots can't pull that phosphorus out of the, the mineral portion of the soil, just like they can't get nitrogen from the atmosphere. God never designed them to pull those nutrients directly from the soil, the inorganic portion. The organic portion, yes, inorganic, no. And so there's bacteria that that's what they do. They convert the inorganic to organic plant available. So there's a couple organisms in there, a panteo and a pseudomonas. And that's what they do. They go out and they, they convert that inorganic phosphorus to plant available phosphorus. And phosphorus is a huge expense. And, and it, I promise you, you will not see phosphorus prices go down in the future. There's only one way for phosphorus to go, and that is up because phosphorus is a mined product. It's a limited product. And everybody in the world wants to use it. You know, traditional agriculture is pretty heavy on phosphorus use. And they're not making more of it. They can only mine what's there and those supplies are getting limited. And guess what? Some of that stuff is coming out of some of these countries that either don't like us very much or they're involved in wars right now. And, and shipping phosphorus to the United States is not on the top of their priority list. And I'll throw it right in there, Keith, because I've done some work on this place. There's a large phosphorus mine in Florida that is actually owned by another nation. It's not owned by anyone in the United States. So if they wanted to on any given day, they could shut that mine down and starve America, basically. I, I've been in this mine. I've worked on restoring some habitat there. So yeah. anyway, this is so critical. Besides just saving a guy like me, you know, my combine's a 10-pointer with a non-typical handle on there. So saving a guy like me from having to pay for so much phosphorus is a huge, huge benefit. Yeah. And, you know, because phosphorus is so important, we, we didn't want to just leave it with the, the Rhizo Fixer Plus. It's a good product, but uh, there, there's other things that we can do. And so the thing that I'm re we're really excited about this year is we've got a brand new product. It's called MicroGreen NPK. And, and so this is part of this Green Boost package. And the MicroGreen NPK is a mycorrhizal fungal, fungi product uh, with other things added as well. And so mycorrhiza, uh, again, if you watch that carbonomics talk, it will explain a lot of this. If you're, if you're kind of a geeky nerd kind of guy and like to dive into those details, I would recommend that. But the mycorrhiza are absolutely the best organism for getting the phosphorus. They, they literally can liquefy solid mineral and turn it into plant available nutrients. And they, these mycorrhiza, they grow from the plant roots out into the soil. And so it's a direct connection. I mean, it's like a pipeline. It's like building pipelines and you are just funneling these nutrients straight to your plants. Uh, that's what mycorrhiza do as long again as long as the plant is willing to pay for it by feeding that 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 fungal colony that population feeding it carbon which plants can do that's what they do they photosynthesize they can make all the carbon they need not only to grow themselves but to feed their friends to feed the bacteria to feed the fungus and so they feed these plants and they're just they're bringing in liquid nutrients that they're they're essentially liquefying the solid part that plants can't get, and they're turning it into something the plants can get. And so mycorrhiza have always kind of been the holy grail of biological additions because they're so critical. Uh, they're the ones that can supply all kinds of water as well. They're, they're probably the most important biological community uh, for plants to grow. And, uh, you know, they've always been very expensive. You can't just take mycorrhiza and put them in a vat and add the right things and blow up the populations. Like bacteria are cheap because you can make huge quantities in a lab pretty quickly. Mycorrhiza don't work that way. Fun fungal products in general don't work that way because you can't just, they don't multiply rapidly like that. You have to actually grow them out. It's, it's time intensive, it's labor intensive, and they're quite a bit more expensive. And so this new product, again, this is a this is a company actually from, from India that we got associated with. They're going to be making their product here in St. Louis. Uh, but uh, these are some of the top uh, micro, mycorrhiza scientists in the world uh, making this product for us. And we had them custom design a mix just for us. So it's called MicroGreen NPK. It's got 10 different species of mycorrhiza. And now that may not sound like a lot, 
But when you look at most commercial mycorrhiza products on the market right now only have four. Uh, some of them have eight, but most of them just have four different species. This one has 10 species. And so again, it's all about diversity, whether it's the plants or the roots or the biology. We wanted to get as many different species out there because we don't know which one's going to work best in a given situation. And, and it's going to change from year to year. And so 10 different species, 250,000 what they call colony forming units per acre, uh, which again, if you don't have any point of reference, you don't know if that's a lot or a little, but again, compared to the other products on the market, that's a lot. That's, that's a big number for, uh, the, for the fungi. When you start talking bacteria, you're talking in the trillions there. But again, you can blow those populations up so fast. The mycorrhiza, you don't need that many because what will start in one plant it will actually grow to another plant and then grow to another plant. So one mycorrhiza fungi organism can cover a large area and it actually connects the root system of all your plants and it allows them to share nutrients back and forth, which is absolutely one of the coolest things that, that I've ever seen. So they actually have lab evidence of a corn plant and a soybean plant. Their root systems are connected by the mycorrhiza and they've observed the soybean plant, which you know, has the rhizobia, so it can make nitrogen. It's sending nitrogen over to the corn plant through the mycorrhiza and the corn plant in return, it's a better scavenger of phosphorus. It's sending phosphorus back. Super cool how God designed this system. When you get the right plants and the right biology, plants cooperate with each other. They don't compete. And, and that's what we're trying to do with these mixes. Keith, that's incredible. And you've shared with some studies and I found some studies of my own and and what I've realized at my place, of course, we're really rocky. Everyone knows, man, we're just a rock pit. And in real terms, these organisms can take nutrients out of those rocks. And not all at once. not like grinders out there pounding rocks down. Right, right. And make them available to plant. And I believe after watching this for 20 plus years, you know, we've been no-tilling and planting blends for a long time, even before I understood all this stuff. Uh, and I'm growing really good crops, by most people's opinion, on rocks. I mean, when we have a field day or a field event, and we've had to, you know, the Senate Ag Tour here, and people are just amazed at yeah. what's growing yeah. on rocks. And I'm now understanding that it's these microbes and bacteria and fungus that are that are utilizing that base, just like it would in the clay or something that's hard to deal with, to provide yeah. these nutrients to the plants. Yeah. Yeah, don't, don't think of them as rocks. Think of them up as long-term nutrient storage containers, I guess. But, but really, the worse your soil is, and, and when I say worse, you know, if you don't have, you know, three foot deep, black, rich, Iowa topsoil type things, if the worse your soil is, the absolutely more important it is for you to have the right biology. Because, you know, the only thing that's going to change that rocky soil into good, rich, you know, humus rich topsoil, like what you're developing, it's got to be two things. It's got to be a green growing plant working in connection with a diverse microbial community. And when you have that, man, you, you are a testament. I've been, I've been to your farm. I've tried to dig in your soils and you can't get that spade in the ground without hitting a whole bunch of rocks, but yet it's, it's rich soil in amongst that and things do very, very well there. So I want to get back you know, to the microgreen. So it's, it's got the 10 species of mycorrhiza in there, but then the NPK part of it is we weren't satisfied with just that. We, we, told, we told this company that we want this product to not only have the mycorrhiza, but we also wanted a suite of bacteria in there as well to do additional things. So uh, there's, there's 10 different types of bacteria along with the 10 different types of mycorrhiza. And some of those are nitrogen fixers, just like what we have with the with the rhizo fixer. So it's a but it's a different organism. It's a zodobacter, not an azospirillum. So it brings another family of free living nitrogen fixers. And then there's another one also that actually lives inside the, the plant uh, vascular system that helps convert nitrogen. And then there's a couple of phosphorus solubilizing bugs in there as well. Again, like the rhizo fixer, but it's a different family. So we've got, we've got the same function, but with different families. So again, we're bringing diversity to the table. And then one thing that's really unique, and I'm not aware of any other product on the market right now that does this, but they have a, a bug that they found, a bacteria, it's, it's a bacillus uh, type bacteria, 
uh, that actually will help solubilize and deliver potassium to your plants as well. And, and that's pretty unique because you don't see many products that are saying this will help solubilize potassium. Phosphorus, yes, that's out in some commercial products. Potassium is pretty unique and pretty rare. Now, we never worry about potassium because here in Nebraska, we have very high potassium soils. So it's not something we've ever had to add. So I have to be reminded that not everybody is blessed with the good soils that we have, but, but everybody has potassium in their soils. It's just not available to plants in everybody's soil. So we think that this is going to be a, a really important addition to this product is having that potassium solubilizer in there to help free some of that up for your plant. So again, you don't have to put that in as a added commercial synthetic potassium product. Because again, it's it's expensive. It's something that has to be mined and manufactured. And, you know, with transportation costs, it's, it's just as brutal how much, you know, some of the potassium fertilizers can cost. You know, there's other advantages here, Keith, is that when you get a big rain on a lot of soil types, and you just put out some NPNK or triple 10, whatever you want to call it, a portion of it's going in the river, right? I mean, it's, it's leaving your property, literally. This has been shown over and over and over again. There's actually lawsuits in a couple of places in America about so much nitrogen getting into water source downstream that's yeah, yeah. harming cities or whatever. So, But these bacteria are bound to stuff. They're not going downstream, at least at that rate or anything. And it's not synthetic. It's natural. If they do... It's a non-issue. It's just going to make some dirt a little bit better somewhere else. It's an absolute non-issue. So that is a yeah. huge plus. Yeah, from an environmental standpoint, it's 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 such a much better way to go. And and you know when 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 the nitrogen is being fixed biologically, the plant controls that. The plant turns that on and off. The plant will call for nitrogen when it needs it, and when it's got enough, it says, "Okay, guys, you know, just hold on." You know, we'll need some more later, but you can stop now. So the plant regulates how much is being produced based on what those plants' needs are. And so you don't have the overproduction uh, like you do if you're putting out, you know, 150 pounds of nitrogen for the crop. That's all out there at once. And, and nitrogen especially is very water soluble. And you get a big rain and you have runoff, which, you know, in a big rain, most places do. Uh, you're going to lose a lot of that. And unfortunately, you know, we're here in Nebraska, we have we have huge problems with nitrates in our groundwater. You go to other states where they don't have as much groundwater, they've got huge nitrate problems in the surface water. And, and also phosphorus loading issues. You know, the Great Lakes is having a lot of uh, problems with, you know, the green, the blue-green algae blooms, which is very toxic. Uh, that's mostly because of phosphorus runoff. And uh, it's it's a real deal and it's a real issue. And is it going to make a difference, you know, if the guy with a one acre food plot is doing it differently? In the big scheme of things, maybe not. But you know what? If enough people do it, it will start making a difference. And it will definitely make a difference in your own little environment. And so I think sometimes people think I'm such small scale, whatever I do isn't going to matter. Well, guess what? It does matter because there's lots of people. If lots of people do the wrong thing, it does add up, even if they're doing wrong things that, uh, and I don't, shouldn't say wrong thing, but if lots of people are doing something that contributes, you know, to the environmental degradation, lots of people at a small scale adds up to a large scale. You know, here's something that we can feel the effects or see the effects of quickly is our pocketbook because we're $10, $12 an acre or something like that for what mm -hmm. you're talking about. But if you go to the store and I check prices recently, and let's just say you're putting 200 pounds of 10, 10, 10 down, which is probably not enough if you're using that traditional system. I mean, that'd be 20 pounds of nitrogen, 20 pounds of phosphorus, 20 pounds of potassium per acre. Most plants require more than that to, you know, to mature and be productive. Uh, but guys, the cost on that is way more than the cost of letting nature do it in these systems God provided. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's exactly right. And, and like I said, the, the, the seed mixes, you're going to see an increased price on them. Some of it, you know, seed is just up. Everything is up. But, but a lot of the price increase is going to be because of all this added biology, and, and particularly the mycorrhiza. Because, again, the bacteria are relatively cheap. That mycorrhiza is always going to be expensive. 
a full rate of mycorrhiza on most products out on the market right now is 12 to $15 an acre by itself, just the four species of mycorrhiza with nothing else. Well, for that same money, about that same price point, you know, we're getting the 10 species of mycorrhiza plus all of these other organisms, all these other bacteria uh, that I'm describing. And so, you know, our suggestion to offset that cost, you need to reduce your fertilizer. You, you, and, and, and you have to, because here's the thing, Grant, if you're spending all this money on all these organisms, these microbes, and you still put all that fertilizer out there, the plant plants are, plants are smart. They're going to take the free stuff first before they expend their carbon resources through photosynthesis to, to ramp up the biology. So if you put too much fertilizer out there, you're actually defeating the purpose of having the plant take advantage of what these biological organisms can do for them. So uh, we think that you should cut back on the fertility that you've been doing by 50% the first year. And I think you can cut back 50%, 50%, 50%. So let's just say you were doing 200 pounds. The, if this is the first year you're doing it, cut that down to 100 pounds this year, and then do it again next year, cut that 100 down to 50 and then the next year, cut that 50 down to 25. So a 50, 50, 50 reduction. And then after that, experiment. Leave a strip where you put nothing and just see if you can tell a difference. I mean, that's that's kind of what you did. You're, you're to where you haven't used any commercial fertility inputs for years. And I've been to your place. Your plots look every bit as good as anything that gets heavily fertilized. Yeah, it's a huge savings, not only in that, but in time. And of course, when your fertilized buggies are heavy, or if you're mean, you got a backpack, you got a bag in a backpack and a bag up here in your spreader, you know, it's, that's what I call elk camp training, right? You're working out there. And, but if you're using a buggy from a local co-op or something, that's that, you're crushing more soil, right? You're, yeah. you're crushing those pores down so water can't infiltrate and air can't get in the soil, and you're probably killing some earthworms when you're driving across there. There's a, a lot of negatives, and soil controls the water cycle and the air cycle. Everything we need to exist starts mm -hmm. in the soil. And yeah, it, it is, and and. And that's why I get so excited when, you know, I read a report about, you know, hey, you know, we observe soybean and corn sharing nutrients back and forth because they're tied together by the biology. That will never happen, never happen without the biology because those plant roots don't physically connect. It's the biology that connects them. And it's, and it's just so obvious, Grant, how God created the system to work. But when we farm in such a way or we food plot in such a way that ignores all the biology, then we start seeing our plants show deficiencies, which makes sense because we cut out a big portion of what is needed to make it work. And that's all of the biological community. And so when, when people do what you've done at the proving grounds and have done it in such a way that not only encourages but enhances the biological community, you know, then then things work the way that God created it. You know, you're always saying, you know, go out and enjoy creation, but listen to what the creator is telling you. Well, I think the creator is telling us, hey, the system has it. Just get out of the way and let it work the way I made it to work. And and we're seeing that on larger scale farms. We're seeing that on, on you know, small plots like this as well. Uh, you know, we haven't used any phosphorus fertilizer now for uh, five years because we've been putting on these biological amendments. You know, we've cut back on our nitrogen. We're, we're working on cutting back even more. Uh, but certainly the phosphorus has been uh, a big area where we've really cut back. And that's that's been a huge, huge savings. I want to talk about the, the third product that's in this, this green boost. So we've got the Rhizofixer with all the rhizobia. We've got the microgreen that has the big uh, addition of the mycorrhiza fungi. And then the third product is, is our Hyperdrum product. And it's a product that, that we're actually, uh, we, we own part of another company called Elevate Ag, and we're actually manufacturing this product ourselves because it's a combination of a bunch of different components. Now, this one has some biology in it, but the real uh, claim to fame of this one is the stimulant package that's in it. And so, uh, it, it's got things like sea kelp, uh, liquid liquid sea kelp, and sea kelp has over 70 different trace minerals, and it's very widely known to, to be a really good microbial stimulant. It helps boost germination rates. Uh, it's got humic acid, which is a very pure source of very small 
carbon particles uh, that helps balance the system out as well as uh, stimulating microbial growth. Uh, it's got a product called Kytosan, which is an extract from all of these uh, like crab shells and oyster shells. And Kytosan will elicit a, an immune response in young plants. So when we have that Kytosan right on the seed, as that seed germinates, it's, it's essentially, it's like an Im immunity boost uh, against diseases and against insects. And again, th this product is being commercially used, the Kytosan product, it's being commercially used on millions of acres of corn and soybean acres as uh, they, they call it a systemic acquired um, resistance, SAR, uh, and, but it's, it's Kytosan, that's what they're using to do that. So we've got that in that product. It's got some yucca act extract, which is another stimulant. And then just this past year, we've added a really valuable portion to this hypergerm product. And it's a, it's, a, it's a fungal compost extract. So what that means is we make a compost out of these really highly fungal compost. And then instead of having to add the actual compost to the seed, we run it through an extraction process, which pulls out into a liquid form it pulls out not only a lot of the fungal spores, but also the chemicals that those fungal spores have emitted or created. And a lot of times those chemicals, those little uh, molecules will signal the plant to do things. And so again, we've got the fungal and then we've got all these stimulants and that is another thing that is added. So that's the third part of the Green Boost package. And we're putting all three of these on the seed and mixing it right in all together. I am so excited about all this because I remember the days, I remember, you know, decades ago, people would say, now use Coke as a sticker. Well, Coke is so acidic, you pour it on your battery post to, you know, to clean it up so your battery would make connection. It's probably killed all the microbes we thought we were doing after we laid down a knocklet package on our dash and drove around the county for two or three hours mm -hmm. with it up in the mm -hmm. sun. So this automates all that. It's in a much more stable form, got a lot more diversity. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi, to my knowledge, was not even talked about large scale at, you know, back then decades ago. So this is really an advancement. And you're allowing uh, us food plot guys to take advantage of the cutting edge technology in production ag, which we're usually decades behind that. So this is a big step for food plotters and I'm super excited. Yeah, we're excited too, because I, I, again, we're, we're using this on, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres within the ag industry, we're using the same seed for food plots. Why not use the same biology? And so that's, you know, that's the decision that we made. So uh, as you order seed, uh, either off the website, or if you uh, call in and talk to, to Colton Tony, he's kind of our food plot expert. you will be able to explain more of this in detail if anybody has additional questions. Uh, you, again, you'll notice the price is higher but you need to offset that by really cutting back on, on the, your fertility package um, because that's we need to get the system designed to work the way God created it. And that's getting the biology back involved. So I want to stop you right there, Keith, because food plotters, myself included in the past anyway, are really bad. You know, if, if 200 pounds is good, 400 pounds is better, grow bigger antlers quickly. But that's not the case here, guys. We need to, need to back off that MP and K and let these much more efficient and less expensive microbes and fungus do the work. You wanna cut down on those, uh, not just as a cost savings for these bugs to do their work and have the right environment to thrive in. We wanna cut down, as Keith suggests, about 50%, whatever you've been putting out, reduce that by 50% this year, reduce that amount by 50% next year. You may be so lush and growing by then that you're just saying, hey, I'm not going to the fertilizer store anymore. And, you know, if you're nervous about that, and, and we work with a lot of farmers that are, and, and, and I totally get that because, you know, th these are important things. Here, here's what we suggest. It's a little more work, but you can actually kind of do your own research right in your own field. What, if you have the ability to do this, what's really good is, is you fertilize the majority of the field to whatever you're comfortable with, cutting back 50%, 75 you know, whatever it is. But do one strip, one pass through the field where you put on that full rate, that full 200 pounds, and then do another strip. Again, depending on the equipment that you're using and how you can do it, but at least leave a little patch where you don't put anything on. So you got a full rate, 
a zero rate and then then your normal rate. And then you can look at that full rate and your zero rate and you can say, eh, maybe I cut back a little too much or, you know what, I probably didn't cut back enough. Uh, but without doing those sorts of things, you're, you're kind of guessing. So even if it's just a little patch where you put on, you know, a 2x rate and a zero rate and then your normal rate. And then if you're like us, you need to really flag those somehow. Put a flag, put a stake, GPS coordinates or something so that you can come back to that and say, I can't even see my zero rate because it looks just like the rest of the field. Hopefully that's what happens. So you need to really mark those well. Otherwise, the extra effort that you put into this little bit of research uh, kind of goes down the down the tank if, if you're not flagging it and marking it well. But we encourage farmers to do that all the time. Now, the farmers may have more sophisticated equipment. They can turn it on or off for a pass or a swath. You're going to have to figure out how to do that on your own. But if you're really interested in this, it can save you a lot of money if you can prove to yourself on a small scale, not risking very much, I can really cut back a lot on this and it didn't make that much difference. Man, super excited about all this, Keith. Thanks for taking time today uh, to share this with us. And I'm excited to get seed in the ground, but not yet, folks. Our ground is throughout much of the Whitetails range that may be very South Florida, where they do plant a little bit of corn this time of year, but it's, the soil is way too cold. So order your seed, get ready, but don't be putting those seeds in the ground yet. Look forward to seeing some green cover folks down here at our field event, uh, June 9th and 10th. And you'll see the results of this, right? We're going to do a lot of planting and yeah. we'll be able to ride around and pull some plants up, look at the roots, stick a spade in soil about that deep or so, not very deep, but <laughs> see what we got going on. And as always, I'll just end here once again with thanking Keith for making this available to us food plotters. And this is just part of understanding creation because it's mighty, it's powerful. It's, it's so much more than we can comprehend. We just have to open our mind to it and take time every day to seek the Creator's will for your life. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.